Okay, perfect. Uh, hi everyone, um, my name is, is Roger Willis and I've been spending a lot of time recently working on uh, tokens. Uh, now, uh, tokens is a pretty vague and high level name for actually what, what I've been doing, but uh, fear not. Uh, in the presentation we'll get into some detail around um, what kind of things I've been looking at and what kind of design decisions uh, and changes, uh, we're, we're, uh, what, what to kind of design decisions I've had to make and what kind of changes I'm looking to propose to make to the, to the platform to uh, meet all of our customers' re requirements. So that, that's where you guys come in really. So what, what, I, what I'm going to present to you today is um, a, a, a high level overview of what I've been doing for the past couple of months. And uh, it's, a, a, it's just a proposal really, it, nothing set in stone, it's not concrete and I, I very much uh, or we'd very much like uh, your, your comments uh, on it. Um, so really, for the objective for, for this review is um, share our, our ideas. Uh, now, uh, we've, we've already worked on, uh, on some of this stuff um, with, the, with the guys from, from Quorum. Um, so, so Fuzz, who uh, some of you may know, has, has actually already reviewed this, uh, this proposal. Uh, he's sitting in the room next to me. Um, and, but, but we'd like to get some feedback from, from you guys as well. Um, in, in particular, we'd like to uh, know if we have uh, missed or forgotten any um, particular requirements or, or whether the proposed design or proposed approach um, impedes uh, you guys from doing something that, that you would like to do. Uh, so, uh, I, so that's the last bullet point, uh, identify any blockers for, for you guys. Um, so that's it really. Um, so uh, let's begin with what we're actually looking to do going forward. So. Um, as you may know, in the uh, Corda repository to date, we have something called the finance module. And inside the finance module, we've defined um, a cash state and contract, uh, a ca a, an obligation state and contract, some uh, flows for uh, using cash states, uh, and some various other uh, assorted bits and pieces that are, are probably not, not really very useful, to, to be honest. Um, so what we'd like to do is actually deprecate this finance module and publish uh, a, a set of standards for using tokens on, on Corda. So these standards will be analogous to the, um, to the ERC, uh, to the Ethereum ERC standard. So the likes of ERC20 for fungible tokens and ERC721 for non-fungible tokens. Um, obviously in Corda things are a little more complicated. So we don't just have the, there's some contract code representing the token. We need to define states, various other data structures and flows for, for using these, uh, these uh, states in transactions as well. Um, so we, we'll be looking to release all of that as uh, standards at some point in the near future uh, and, and as well produce a tokens SDK uh, which will really just be a set of uh, high level types, so interfaces, abstract classes, um, abstract flows uh, for you guys if you uh, want to um, build core apps that, that use tokens. Um, and as I said, we'll, we'll probably end up deprecating the finance module but that won't be for, for a while because we're, I'm aware that some people are still actually using it. Uh, any questions so far? Okay, great. Um, so I, I know we we always we always say this in the uh, in the quarter white paper we we bang on about everything being an, an agreement uh, and uh, and of course um, it, it is uh, and it, it's not actually self evident um, to to a lot of people that, that use money and, and, and securities right because if you think about cash. You have coins or notes or whatever in your pockets, and in your brokerage account you have securities that the that, that, uh, securities that, that you own. Yes, you do own them, but but actually those securities and that cash is really just in agreement with with another party. So if we take cash for instance, um, uh, what what is what is the money in your uh, what is the money in your bank account? Well, it's actually a liability of your commercial bank, the bank that that, that you bank with, to deliver a liability of the central bank which initially was actually uh, for, for the central bank to deliver some gold, but since we've broken the gold standard, there's actually a, some kind of weird circular relationship between um, the, the li liabilities and, and the asset side of the central bank's balance sheet. But let's ignore that for, for today. That is very much out of scope for the purposes of this discussion. All I'm trying to demonstrate is that everything uh, on Corda is, is an agreement. Now, if you have uh, a share, then what, what does that share represent? Well, it's, uh, it's that the share certificate uh, confers uh, rights to, to you as a shareholder to receive cash flows from the company in the form of dividends, 
uh, and, and that share certificate has a value uh, based upon the present value of all the future dividends that, that the company makes. You also might get some voting rights as well. If you look at a bond, what is the bond? Well, the bond indenture is just a legal agreement that gives you rights to, to cash flows, uh, and it gives you a senior claim on the company in case it's wound up, right? So all these things are just, just agreements. Um, and I, I, it's too much, I think the, the word token is kind of misleading because token to me Im implies something that is not an agreement, but, but maybe, maybe that's just me. Um, I, I guess what I'm trying to get to with this comment is that maybe token isn't necessarily the, the right term to use. Um, but, but for now, we, we are going to use uh, the, the term token to describe what I'm, what I'm doing at the moment. Um, right, so that's pretty straightforward, I hope. Right, apart from, there are some things that are non-agreements on Corda, um, and these are what I believe uh, pseudo-anonymous cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin or Ethereum. Uh, let's say if you, want one, if you wanted to issue one of those natively onto Corda, and indeed Corda can, can do that, just we, we haven't uh, done that yet, uh, or, or we, we haven't bothered to, um, because no one's asked for it. Um, but if we do, then I would argue that, the, that those tokens would not necessarily be agreement, because who, who's the issuer of those tokens? Well, uh, it could be, it, it would be some pseudo-anonymous miner um, that you, I mean, you, you don't know who they are, right? So if there's nobody to sue, then I would argue that this thing does not represent uh, an agreement. The, the token doesn't confer any, any rights to you. Uh, likewise, with uh, those utility tokens that you see um, issued uh, ICOs, they, they're not agreements either because typically they, they, they confer no rights to the owners. Uh, they, 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 it's not equity, um, or at least they, they try to pass it off as not equity. Uh, the regulators might have a, another opinion, but again, that's out of scope for the purposes of this presentation. So well, I, I'm wondering, have I missed anything? Is there anything else that is, that is potentially a, a non-agreement um, uh, that, that, that could be represented on quarter? Um, I guess you, you don't have to answer now, but I think this is an interesting question because uh, I, we, we need to make sure that we get the, get the basics right. Uh, and this is really where I started all of this work from. Um, I guess the benefit of those is, so, so I guess implicitly you're saying that oil owned by BP in storage in Galveston, that they're going to deliver to you is an agreement, but some oil in the ground or some, some random oil in a barrel that's just there is not an agreement you could represent on quarter. Uh, yeah, exactly. So um, clearly you can't represent physical things uh, natively on quarter, right? Uh, you can just represent a claim for someone to deliver that physical thing, thing to you uh, on quarter. Therefore, if you take physical things like property, antiques, barrels of oil, um, uh, I don't know, the thing, physical things that you can pick up or dig out of the ground, uh, then yes, whilst those things are not agreements, if you wanted to represent them on quarter, then it would be an agreement. It would be a claim on an issuer that holds that thing in custody. Um, okay, so th that, that's the basics, really. Um, so now, uh, very importantly, what is the token? So feel free to uh, d debate, discuss, disagree with this, but my, my uh, definition of a token is a contract state on quarter that um, rep represents an agreement with another party. Um, so, but by definition, a token uh, c must contain two party objects. If it only contains one, then it can't be an agreement, right? Because it's a, it's a unilateral thing. Um, in, in Corda, we, we typically call the parties issuer and owner because we, we have an issuer of, of, the, of the token. Let's say um, if we have a, a company that wants to issue shares, shares uh, tokens representing shares on Corda, then the, the company would be the issuer and the owners would be the, the investors. And, and these, these tokens typically uh, confer rights to the owners to make a claim on the issuer, for the issuer to, to deliver what the underlying is, uh, or, um, or, or actually, well, actually the, the, this depends. Um, so the, the token actually uh, is a claim on an issuer in the case of the token being representing something that is asset backed. So if you have a, a custodian holding a share certificates were, which were originally issued off ledger, then that custodian can issue tokens representing those share certificates, and we call this tokenization. Uh, and uh, that token represents a claim on the custodian to deliver the underlying shares. However, you can issue assets uh, natively, uh, so directly onto the quarter ledger, and uh, those those tokens are the legal agreements themselves, right? So. 
So if, you, if you're a company and you wish you shares directly onto the ledger, then, uh, though, then that token rep is the share certificate that represents the claim on the present, uh, on the future cash flows of that company via, via dividends. Um, so typically we say uh, tokens can be split and merged, so we call this fungibility. Um, I, maybe some might say that fungibility isn't necessarily the right term, but I, I think it's a, um, it, it's a term that everybody understands. And, and I think if, if, if we talk about fungibility going forward, we really just mean something that can be split and merged. Uh, or if you, if you have something, then you can represent a fractional ownership in it, potentially. Um, although obviously things don't have to be fungible, they can be non-fungible. Um, and I'm really crucially here that the last point, we, we want tokens to be something that can be transferred without the issuer's involvement. So, so this is where you have a, a chain of provenance in quarter. You, you can have a, an issuer that issues a token. This token passes around um, a bunch of bonus, and then this token can be redeemed uh, with, with the issuer. But the issuer doesn't, doesn't have to be involved in any of those um, subsequent transfers after the issuance of the, of the token. They're only involved in issuances and redemption. Uh, any questions so far? Okay, one quick one for me, just um, just because I know that Cordite has quite a sophisticated view of the issuer side. So where you said party object, you're not precluding in the in this I guess in this intellectual construct you're creating, you're not precluding the idea that that party itself could be a composite or something sophisticated. It's just there's like, there's, there's there's some there's, there's some way of naming the issuer without it being opinionated on what sits behind it. Uh, yeah, that, that's a good point. Yeah, this is maybe a little too restrictive, just saying a, a party object. But indeed, it could be a composite entity. It could be, it could be. Uh, as always, there's, a, there's a concept of composite keys in Corda, so you can have a, a, a public key which is actually made up of multiple public keys, and each one of those keys could be owned by a separate legal entity. So indeed, you can have this concept of a of a composite party, or I don't know, what, what do you guys call them? Um, DAOs. A DAO, oh yeah, a, a DAOs. Uh, decentralized autonomous organisations, of course. Um, so, so yes, uh, you, you can have uh, those as well. Um, so it doesn't necessarily just have to be a single legal entity or natural person as an owner. Uh, okay. So, wh what types of tokens can we can we have? Uh, this is really just a, a, a copy paste from the um, from the paper which I sent around earlier that hopefully uh, most of you guys uh, got a chance chance to read. Um, really, what I tried to do here was um, enumerate all types of things um, that you, you might possibly want to put on, on the ledger, and then I split them between assets and agreements. So uh, I realize that agreement is overloaded here, um, but really I, I'm, I'm looking at the, at the thing from the, from the holder's perspective. So if you have a commodity or equity or currency or whatever, then it's an asset from your perspective. However, you can also see in the table that I said it's, a, it's an asset of the token or receipt holder, but it's also a liability of somebody else. Um, and I also say whether this thing can be an asset back token, as I mentioned prior, or whether it can be something that can be issued natively onto the ledger. Um, I think it's pretty important to get this stuff right because um, if we know exactly how to represent all types of things uh, using the, the proposed model, then in a sense the, the proposed model probably feels right. So if we have uh, things missing from this table or you think any of the designations are incorrect, then please feel free to uh, chip in comments either uh, uh, on the phone now or uh, drop us, a, drop us an, an email. Um, so you can see on the table below I've got agreements and those are typically things like um, OTC derivatives, exchange traded derivatives, um, and then there's actually loans uh, that have been um, chopped off at, at, at the bottom. Uh, these things are uh, probably non-fungible, so there will be non-fungible tokens, uh, though uh, you can actually represent them with fungible tokens. You just create a token where there's only one of the thing issued. Um, and if you want to create fra fractional ownership in that one thing, then you just issue more tokens. So if you issue two tokens, then each token is a 50% share of ownership in this one, uh, one thing. Uh, so so there's, there's actually multiple ways to skin a cat, uh, if, if you will, uh, with, with this approach. Um, but I, I think that this, this table probably does need a, a bit of studying uh, before, um, you, before you can comment on it. Uh, but please do have a look in your free time. Uh, so, so what do we have now? Um, we have a, a finance module, as I mentioned. It really just implements obligation and cash. So obligation is an obligation to deliver some um, generic uh, 
contract state type, and cash uh, is um, essentially uh, asset backed. Uh, um, uh, it, it, it's um, rather it's a, a claim on a, a bank deposit or a claim on a, a central bank reserves, uh, however you, you wish to use it. Uh, but cash is quite inflexible. Um, yet the, um, the 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 actual the, the the way it has been designed is actually quite similar to how you would design a token. So so the cash um, ha the cash contract is a cash state rather has an amount field of, of some of some currency has an owner has the notion of an issuer. And that's kind of what we want to see in a, in a token, except we want a token to be able to, um, we want a token to be able to uh, represent uh, any arbitrary thing uh, as opposed to just currency. Um, and then uh, the interfaces that we have defined in the core platform, um, some of you may have come across these before, but for those that haven't, uh, contract state is the base interface for any, any state object on quarter, and it just makes you implement a list of parties that uh, should um, and being notified of updates um, about this uh, particular state object. Um, then you've got something that's ownable that uh, makes you define an, an owner. Uh, though this is an ownable state isn't um, applicable all, all the time, I, I think. But th then we have this fungible asset state, which makes you um, define something that is ownable and has an issuer, and it's an amount of uh, and it's an amount of something. And the cash contract implements this uh, interface. Um, the, the fungible asset in space is, a, a, I feel it's a little inflexible because you might want to have something that is a fungible but not necessarily issuable, issuable or ownable. Um, it, it, those, those terms issuable, issuable and ownable are um, a little misleading, I think, sometimes. Um, so the, the semantics don't quite make sense for me. Um, then lastly, we have a, a linear state, which is um, typically you use it to uh, define a state that represents a, a workflow um, or, or something that is non-fungible. And it's non-fungible because each linear state has, its, has, has a unique identifier inside it. Um, so you, you, can't, you can't split and merge these, these things. Uh, each linear state must have its own linear ID. Um, so we, we kind of nearly, we, we kind of got, I don't know, 70% of the, the way there with the current interfaces. But I think we, need, we, we can still improve upon things. And that's what I've been looking to do uh, over the last uh, month or so. Um, so, any questions so far? Um, okay, so what, what do we need uh, to um, represent uh, tokens in, uh, the, mo in the best uh, in the best way possible? Um, so, we need a, a model that's flexible enough to define any type of state. Uh, so, so maybe not just tokens. Maybe, maybe need to define something, something else that we haven't even thought of yet. So we want this model to be as flexible as possible. Then the, the second point I think is a really important one, and I'm going to talk about this a, a bit more later on, and that is to separate the life cycle of the token type um, from the question of who, who owns it. Uh, so, so currently with the cash contracts, you have the, a currency object embedded into, um, the, into, the, into the cash state. Uh, so we can say that the, the the token type is tightly coupled with the with the cash state. So uh, yes, you can possibly change it, but it's, it's a bit of a pain. You have to do a contract upgrade. Uh, but but what if uh, what if that token type needs to change? Um, I mean, not, not all token types need to change, but of course some of them some of them would do. Uh, so let's say if you have a token type which is an equity instrument, then you would expect that equity instrument to have its own life cycle. So the the, the company that issues the equity instrument pays dividends. Um, they might do a share split or they might uh, do a rights issue or something like that. And all of that needs to be managed separately from the question of who actually owns uh, a token representing some equity in, in a company. I'll talk a bit more about this later. Um, but I think this is a really important idea, but I'd love to get your views on what you think about this. <clears throat> um, third thing, um, kind of less important, but, but I think it's useful to guide developers in the right direction. Uh, we want to define a set of interfaces uh, for common token types. So you might have something that is issuable that makes you define a, an issuer party. You might have something that is redeemable that defines some behaviors around what should happen when a token is redeemed. Um, there, there are other ones. You might want to represent something that's an asset-backed token versus a, a, native, a ledger native token. Uh, and there's, there's various other ones that we might want to uh, implement. And all of these interfaces can be composed together to create certain types of tokens. Um, 
and, and that's where you come to the, the, the next level. So the next level might be, hey, well, we all, all equity tokens have uh, similar characteristics, so why can't we define an interface for, for those? And each one of these could come with its own standards as well. But to be honest, I'm not so interested in getting into the weeds on defining interfaces for equities and uh, fixed income instruments and loans, derivatives and things. Indeed, if you look at um, uh, ISTA, they've actually uh, done that already uh, for uh, derivatives. So they, they know the, the most about derivatives, so it makes sense for them to create the standards around what they should look like. So we've done a bit of work to, um, uh, to uh, integrate the ISTA common domain model with the, with the quarter state model. Um, and indeed, we'll probably look to other groups to come up with interfaces for things like e equity and fixed income. Uh, but for, for us, we're, we're mainly concerned about de defining the high-level high uh, interfaces and types. Um, the, the last thing uh, is something that's really cool, and uh, I'll spend a bit of time um, uh, on the last couple of slides on this. And we, we, the, what I'm saying here is we want, we want to be able to create um, token types out of uh, existing token types. Um, and the example I've got there is transparent mortgage-backed securities. Uh, I won't say anything more yet, but I'll get to that in the, in the final two slides. Um, uh, uh, I, I think this is a really important concept. And just uh, I know, you know, confuse people when we when we brainstorm this. Uh, we're not proposing to model them in the finance module, or yeah. you know, but, but knowing that knowing that the model we come up with would allow somebody to model it is kind of a, a sign that we're on the right path with the underlying model. Is, is, is what I was trying to get. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So uh, as Richard said, we're, we're not actually going to define types for any of these things. So that's, that's for core app developers to do, but we just want to make very sure that the model that we come up with um, can uh, cater to all of these different types of use cases. Um, and uh, I, I think that, uh, number 0.4 on this slide uh, enables that um, for uh, a lot of use cases. Right, so um, let's start with the flexible model. So it's actually a fairly trivial change. Uh, so those of you who are familiar with Corda know that there is uh, a fungible asset um, state. Uh, as I mentioned, I think it's kind of uh, inflexible. So what I've done is I've created this new fungible, fungible state interface, and uh, it only just defines, it, it makes you define that your state must have a, a, an amount of some, some thing, some, uh, any type of thing. Uh, what we, uh, and we leave the, the question of ownership or uh, issuance to uh, uh, other types. Uh, and, and I think uh, this is an important change because it allows us to um, implement um, uh, tokens that are fungible but not necessarily own ownable. So you can, you can have a fungible agreement uh, or you can also have a fungible token that is not necessarily issued uh, like a, a cryptocurrency potentially. Uh, and, and what does that interface look like? Well, it's pretty simple. It's just an interface with one property uh, that takes a generic type parameter T of any type. Um, so T, would, T here would be your, your token type. So the, the type that defines the, 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 the token, uh, the, the token type that this is a, a, a fungible, I've tied myself up in knots here. Uh, <laughs> this is, uh, the, the T defines the token type. Um, and uh, this, the, the, the state that implements this interface uh, uh, illustrates that somebody holds a certain amount of that token type. Um, so uh, you, you have these two concepts. You have the concept of a token, and you have the concept of a of a token type. And if any of you guys have looked at Cordite, then you will you, you would have seen that they also have this concept of a token and a and a token type as well. Um, so it, it makes sense. Hi, Roger. That you have one. Uh, yeah. Hello. Yes, Roger. This is Jesse. Can you hear me well? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, please go ahead. Uh yeah, quick question. I mean, you, you're, you're talking about the fungible state and fungible tokens. In the previous slide, it looks like the fungible asset uh, will be extended by the fungible state. So I, I know on slide seven, you were representing uh, different ways of representing assets. Where does the fungible token fit in that picture? Um, sorry, that's a mistake. The arrow should be the other way around. So the arrow from fungible state to fungible asset should be the other way around. Yeah. yeah. So that so fungible asset should extend the fungible state. Does that make sense? Uh, it, I mean, what I can maybe do is show you some. Uh, well, back, uh, afterwards, I can show you the, the code. Uh, so I've actually made the change in the code base to support this. And if you if you 
if you go onto the master branch uh, of uh, Corda and you look inside the fungible asset.kt file, you'll see that fungible asset is implements fungible state. Um, so we, we've already implemented this in, in the platform. Um, that hopefully that answers your question. Sorry for the, um, for the mistake on the slide. So my question was about where does the fungible token fit in that picture? The fung oh, so the, the fungible token would, would sit underneath uh, fungible state. Uh, it would implement fungible state and it would implement ownable state. Um, so so these, okay. these are just the, the, the base types inside the, the core. And then we would implement fungible token inside this tokens SDK. Uh, yeah, sorry if that's not, not clear. Um, and then also inside the SDK, we would implement token type, um, which is probably a linear state uh, because it's, it's a definition that can evolve o over time. Thank you. Cool. Cheers. Uh, I can note. Cool. And does fungible asset have a life in the new world or is it something that will be deprecated? Um, because if you've got, if you're going to have something that implements fungible state and an ownable state that you call token, then that means token and fungible asset are the same thing. Um, not necessarily, because you can have a token. So the the issuer will be defined inside the token type, um, not inside the fungible, uh, not inside the the token. So you have these two concepts: the token and the token type. Okay. And the token is an amount of token type, and the issuer will be defined in in that. Um, so, it, it, I mean, I guess it's, it's kind of similar, um, but uh, I think, I mean, for, if it was up to me, we, could, we should just keep fungible assets. So there's no need to deprecate it, but I mean, we, I guess that's something we can consider uh, another time. Okay. Um, right. So, so the next thing that we're looking to do is separate token lifecycle from ownership. Um, so this was point two on the on the slide of changes that I uh, that I mentioned. Um, so my vision for this is um, imagine that the corner network where you have a whole bunch of uh, token issuers. They might be issuing equities, bonds, uh, cash, or money, um, and, and other various things as well. Uh, claims on barrels of oil, um, you name it, anything. Um, I would expect that these token issuers maintain reference data about the tokens that they issue, right? I mean, who, who better uh, is there to uh, create and maintain that reference data than the token issuers themselves, right? So uh, imagine you're a bond issuer and uh, you, 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 you issue a bunch of bonds and they're owned by uh, parties on the network. Well, it's, it's your, uh, I, I would hope it's the responsibility of the issuer to, um, to create and syndicate reference data about those bonds. So how would, how would that happen? How would that work? Well, the, the issuer would probably create a, what we call a data distribution group, which is a, a, a decentralized way to syndicate data um, around a, a quarter network. Um, so you essentially create a graph-like structure to, uh, to which you propagate um, updates to states, and then those can be recorded by all the parties that subscribe to, to that group. So you might want to, uh, this bond issuer may issue just some information about the bond, the, the, the nominal amount of it, the coupon um, uh, includes maybe the bond indenture as a PDF and, and various other, various other thing, uh, information, bits of information about this bond. Then this uh, information can be shared um, about, uh, about the bond. Now, Clearly, this information exists in a in a separate state. So, how do we how do we link uh, the information about the bond to uh, to the token uh, representing an amount of ownership of, of a bond? Well, uh, we need some uh, we need this concept of a pointer. We need a, a pointer to uh, some to another state on, on the ledger, um, and uh, I think that's an important concept. It, it's a concept that, that actually it, it, it's a feature that the people actually use in Corda to, today. Um, they will put either a, a state ref or a linear ID in one of their state objects, and then they will resolve that state uh, to uh, re resolve that linear ID or state ref to uh, the, the actual contract state that, that it points to. Uh, and I guess this is similar to doing a, a, 
a, a, a join in a SQL, between two tables in a SQL database, um, where the, the linear ID or the state wrap is a, is a foreign key of um, a, a state in another table, for instance. Um, and what we're doing here is linking the, the, linking the token representing ownership in a bond, for instance, to the actual underlying information about that bond. Now, the cool thing here is that the, that the, the, the bond issuer can then uh, unilaterally update that information about the bond. Let's say if there's a, a credit event or if, they, um, uh, if there's a restructuring or they need to, um, uh, I, I don't know, pay, pay, a, um, a, 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 pay a coupon, then that can be updated inside the, the linear state representing the bond. And that's completely separate to the question of ownership. Does that all make sense so far? Okay. Maybe um, people who weren't on the the DLB that covered it reference states. I guess they're in. It depends on the reference states. They're in quarter four, and the docs are already written, so people can hunt around master, and they'll be able to see the docs for reference states of this DLB. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Richard. That's a good point. So what I what I didn't mention is that this makes heavy use of the reference states feature that will that will be included in quarter four. Uh, so reference states are um, states uh, that can be included in a, in a transaction. So it's essentially reference data included in a transaction. They're not in the inputs or outputs list. Um, they can be referred to by states in the inputs or outputs list, um, uh, but uh, they are not consumed uh, when, the, uh, when the transaction is committed to, to ledger. So you can, you, can, you can essentially have copies of a, a state uh, included as a reference in many, many transactions uh, without having to um, to uh, consume that state object every time. And, and the, the, the notary checks that the data is current as well. So let's say if you want to um, have a reference state in a transaction and um, you, you have an older version of it, the notary will tell you it's an old version. Then you can request the, the new version of it from the issuer of that reference data via, or, or you might autonomously get it, uh, automatically get it through the data distribution group that that uh, issuer provides. Um, so, so yes, I appreciate there's a couple of bits here that aren't, aren't available yet. Um, so the, there's, a, there's a very early implementation of data distribution groups on a branch in the Calder repository. Um, and uh, I'm working on the, um, the code for um, pointers, for state pointers at, at the moment. Um, so, so that's at the pull request stage. Um, but, but of course, if you, if you think any of this doesn't make sense, you think it's mad, or you think there's a better way to do it, then uh, please, please let me know. Or if you think this doesn't cater to some of your requirements, then again, uh, please let us know. A quick, quick question, Roger. This is JC again. Um, are you providing a way to list the current ownership of all these tokens? So let's say if you are a share issuer, like a, a corporation, and you are distributing your shares on Ledger, at some point you will want to maintain some kind of a ledger of all your shares and who is currently owning them even after the fact? Are you providing an easy way for the issuer to list the current ownership of all the tokens? Uh, thanks, JC. That's an interesting question. It's, it's also come up today um, from somebody else, actually. Um, I, I don't know if Timo's on the line. Uh, he, we were having a discussion about this via email um, to today. Uh, and it's, it's a very interesting question. So um, the answer is, yes, you can absolutely do that. All you would need to do is put the issuer inside the participant's um, list of the state object. And the issuer will be, uh, if you will, CC'd in every transaction involving that, that uh, token representing um, some, equity, some share of equity uh, in, in the company. Um, now, then the, uh, the, the company can then aggregate all of that data and produce a, a cap table, essentially, of, of who owns what. Now, what, uh, uh, whilst it's possible to do that, I'm not sure whether it's necessarily a it's necessarily something you would want to do, uh, unless of course the regulations force you to do it, um, because it 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 makes uh, it makes the the issuer um, a single point of failure, a single point of authority. Um, it reduces the privacy of your transactions because the issuer gets to see uh, all the other states in transactions involving their states. Uh, and and there's, there's various other, other things that, uh, I, I don't know, I'll, I'll be wary of, um, 
that, that would lead me to be wary of, of using such a such an approach. Um, but uh, it, it's definitely possible. Definitely possible. Thank you. And just as an aside, you know, one of the things we discussed was you know, in a world where you're not sharing the data with the issuer, and it almost it always brings you back to the old days of you know, bearer bonds and coupons you clip off. You know, then got the point of, well, if you're juicing it from the issuer, if they're not being kept copied as you go along, the burden and responsibility flips, and it's now your job as the owner of the asset periodically to prove when it's your, when, when you have the right to claim something. You, you know, on demand, you prove to the owner, to the issuer, that you owned it at the time, you know, you know when it went next year or whatever, and therefore the you know, much to pay is you kind of flips it on its head. Yeah, exactly. That, that's a good point, actually. So. So let's say um, we have a, uh, a token type uh, representing equity in a company, and that, that company then declares a dividend, pushes out that update to the token type to via a data distribution group to everybody on the network. Then everybody that holds that token will be notified that there's a dividend. So how do they claim the dividend? Well, they can send their, uh, their shares, uh, their tokens, uh, as a reference state back to the issuer, and then the issuer can tick off that uh, those states have been, uh, that a dividend has been uh, paid in respect of those states and then send uh, some cash back to that party. Uh, so it, it's a, a, a nice mechanism uh, to be able to deal with corporate actions and, and things like that, um, which I, I think is a, a, a cool um, uh, property of, 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 this, of this feature. Um, yeah. Um, okay. So, um, how, how does this work? Um, this is just a simple diagram to illustrate. Uh, so let's say if you have a, a token uh, and it's an amount of something. Um, so what, what you could do here is you could, you could embed the, uh, the token type directly into the token, like we've done with the cash contract, say just the, the currency, GBP in there or whatever. But what you can do is have an amount of a pointer to some other state. Um, so uh, for any of you guys that have been C programmers, it's exactly the same concept of a pointer or a reference in programming. Uh, you, you have uh, a, a number that uh, can be resolved into uh, a thing uh, that is uh, sitting behind the, the, the pointer. Uh, here we have this concept of a linear pointer, which takes a, a linear ID, and then uh, you can use a vault query to um, actually resolve that linear ID into the latest version of that linear state. Of course, you can have a static pointer, which is where you just put a state wrap in your uh, token, and uh, then you can resolve that to uh, a, uh, a contract state. Uh, but of course, you might not want to use any of that, and you might just want to embed the, um, the token type directly into your token, at which point there's, there's, there's no need for a pointer. But for things like equi equity and debt, I think there is a, a, a good reason to use a pointer to point to the um, the definition of the token type, which can evolve separately to the, um, the token, which uh, concerns who, who owns an amount of that particular token type. Um, so so that's, that's really how it would work. And I'm working on putting that into the, the, the platform as we speak. Um, but I, I think this is useful um, in n not just tokens, but in, in other areas. And uh, from having looked at quite a few code apps, I see that a lot of people use this pattern. And, and really, this just formalizes the, the, the pattern. Uh, and it makes you think about some of the edge cases. For example, what happens if you can't resolve the pointer? Um, what happens if you're using uh, a, a version of the state which is out of date? For example, you haven't received the most up-to-date version of, of a linear state, then um, this, this new feature makes you think about all of these things, uh, which is quite useful, I think. Um, okay, so, so the next thing um, that we need to introduce are, are token type interfaces. So I mentioned that we want ones to represent things that are issuable or redeemable. And uh, the interfaces themselves are actually pretty simple. It's just you, you'll define um, uh, an, uh, an issuer party. Um, indeed, that could be a composite party. It doesn't necessarily just have to be a, a, a singleton legal entity. Um, uh, likewise, we might want to implement something that is um, uh, redeemable, at which point we want to list a bunch of keys uh, that have to be uh, that, that we need a signature from um, the corresponding signature from to exit this uh, state from from the ledger. Again, we might want something that's an asset back token. So an asset back token is something that's issuable, redeemable, and fungible. Um, so we we can build up uh, from these kind of Lego blocks what uh, the, the, 
different types of tokens would potentially look and behave like. Roger. Um, um, is there any such thing as an asset that's issuable but not redeemable, or redeemable but uh, not issuable? Um, so, yeah, I thought about this actually. Uh, trust you to ask a question like this, Mike. Um, so, uh, question: Are shares redeemable? Are shares redeemable? Ooh. I thought they exist in perpetuity unless there's a share buyback. Uh, no, actually, if there's a share buyback, they they actually end up on the balance sheet of the of the company. So, they're so not, then yeah, they're not redeemable. They're never redeemed. They're not redeemable as the owner's option. Yeah. So shares are never redeemable. Well, not necessarily. Uh, the, the, the joke here about um, homicide criminals being yeah. irredeemable. <laughs> 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 Thanks, James. Because yeah, a common equity is is issuable, not redeemable. Yeah. Something that's redeemable but not issuable. You could argue that payment for transaction fees of Bitcoin, are you redeeming the Bitcoin, but it's not issuable? Yeah, potentially. Um, I, I think it, that, that, well, that's it's worth just merging issuable, redeemable together, and then there's only, and then exit keys would cease to exist, and you assume that if you issue it, you can also redeem it. I mean, does it, I mean, this, this notion of, um, you know, can you redeem a share? We just define redeeming in that case to mean taking off the ledger because you've done a buyback of some sort. I just wonder if it's worth having, like, I would, I just, I'm not sure it's worth splitting these two concepts. I know the current data model is, but I'm not, <laughs> that, that was probably wrong. Um, no, I, it's a good question. Um, I probably need to think about it a bit more. I mean, you, you raise a good point. So, um, as, a, as an ex-accountant, like, I, I, Maybe maybe I have a tendency to look into the, the, the way these uh, the way tokens are actually accounted for on a balance sheet, and really that's not how people would actually use them. So technically speaking, you don't redeem shares ever. Um, uh, if you if you buy them back, they're treasury shares on the balance sheet, so they're never redeemed. Um, but really, does anyone care about that? Probably not. So really, how how in, in how much detail do we want to go into this model? Do we want? Do we care about modeling those types of concepts, or do we? Do we? Or do we just brush over them? Yeah, I mean, you, know, you could always make an issuable but not redeemable state just by blocking it in the smart contract logic, right? You, just because the interface exists doesn't mean you actually have to implement it in all the other parts of the app. Yeah. Also, yeah, wonder sure. like there's a bit of terminological, there's a bit of archaic terminology here. Like it claims to be redeemable, but then it calls it the concept exit in the yeah. in the field. And that should really be like. Redeem keys or something, but then <laughs> are there any cases where the issuer is not the redeemer? Um, Just assuming there is a redeemable token. I don't know, maybe. Um, I, I haven't thought about it yet. Uh, first, what were you going to say? Um, my, my tendency is to avoid overloading interfaces uh, with optionality, if you like. I think that just confuses things further down the line. I, I prefer design patterns where there are discrete building blocks that are quite clear. Um, and there are certainly you can in our use cases we've got um, uh, tokens that are only ever issued. They are never redeemed, but they're used to kind of create um, the unit of currency, if you like, for a certain set of economic behaviours within it, within a completely closed system. Um, and, and there is no burn, if you like. There's an issuance, but there's no burn. Uh, and you, you see that sort of pre-allocated currencies and pre-allocated pre rewards and stuff like that. So it's, I, I think it's, yeah, I, I, I personally feel comfortable with this kind of degree of precision um, because it's less confusing to me for what it's worth. Interesting. And there's, there's another confusion about because Mike and Roger, you were using slightly different meanings of the words. Maybe you need to go back and think about semantics because when I think about redeemable, why I think about redeemable is the option of the owner. Mike was talking about redeemable by the issuer. So we need to figure out whether we need to distinguish those two mm -hmm. concepts. Yeah. Do, do you guys uh, envision uh, being able to split these tokens? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So um, the uh, anything that implements fungible token is splittable and mergeable, assuming that the token type is the same. So if you have a, a one of token type X and a two of token type X, you can merge it into three of token type X and, and split it up as well. And, and you'll, you'll, you'll see there's an interface here that I haven't actually explained, but it's called to tokenizable asset info. 
and, and that makes you define a, um, a um, default fraction digits field. So it tells you how many decimal places that um, particular token should, should have. Uh, so in the case of Japanese yen, it's, it's none. Uh, the smallest unit is one. But in the case of pounds, it's two decimal places, for instance. So, so, so that, that would need to be integrated in there as well. So to make sure that you can add and subtract these um, tokens and split and merge them. Okay. Um, so, so yeah, this is very much up for discussion. This is probably not something we're going to do straight away. Um, and, and indeed, you guys may have implemented some of your own interfaces or have your own type hierarchies <coughs> in mind how you'd like to model this stuff. And uh, I think it's quite fun to consider these these types of things. So, I don't know if you if you want to give it some thought and let us know, post on the mailing list, then that'd be very much appreciated. And I, I'm not particularly opinionated about how we do this, but it's really just about making it as easy as possible for you guys to create token types. Um, okay, so composable token types. I think this is quite fun, actually, because um, what it allows you to do is um, model things the way they actually exist in reality, right? So, so let's say if we want to uh, take electronic money. What actually is electronic money? Let's say if I if I um, uh, start a company uh, which is an electronic money issuer in the in the EU law definition. So I can I can uh, create a token uh, which represents a claim on a on a bank deposits uh, uh, in in some bank. Then then what, how how should I represent this? Well, with this model that we've got here, we can we can represent electronic money as a claim on a GBP bank deposit at Barclays, which is also a claim, which is in turn a claim on, a, on the central bank for an amount of central bank reserves denominated in GBP. Um, if, if we were actually to do this properly, then we would probably have some kind of weird recursive relationship at the very end. And it, it, I, I don't think you would actually be able to terminate uh, the uh, terminate the, uh, the, the hierarchy, but we have to end it somewhere. And um, I, I guess we, we do that with the definition of, of pound sterling. And we just assume that there's nothing on the asset side of the central bank's balance sheet. And GPP is, of course, created uh, by a fiat of, of, of the government, likewise with any other fiat currency. So uh, we, we just assume that that's the lowest common denominator in any uh, kind of uh, currency universe. Uh, and I, I think this is quite cool because it allows you to represent um, things as they actually exist in, in, in reality. Um, now, this might be a bit esoteric. Some of you might not care. Um, maybe a lot of people don't care. Um, it, you, you probably you don't even need to do this, but I think it's cool that you can do it um, because you can, can have these um, very expressive um, uh, uh, token types. Um, and, and of course, you can, you can make your token type depend upon types created by other issuers as well. So, you, you don't have to depend on your own ones. You can, instead of having, um, uh, instead of inlining the, the definitions like we have here, you could actually have the, uh, the definition being a pointer to some state. Uh, so, so really what we're doing here is we're, uh, um, we're, we're telling the, the token owner uh, whose liability um, this, this token is. So initially it's the uh, e-money issue as liability, then it becomes Barclays liability, and then the Bank of England's liability. It's the ultimate liability of the Bank of England. Um, so I guess it's, it's quite, quite cool to, to think about this in, in, in my view. Uh, but even more cool, um, we, uh, I don't know if you guys have seen um, the, the big short. There's this scene uh, where Michael Barry here is a, a fund manager, and he's trying to figure out what is inside a mortgage-backed security note. And he figures out that it's just a bunch of rubbish mortgages backing the notes. Um, and, and that was in, what, 2007? But what if those bonds were issued in 2018? Then you could, you could actually uh, create a token type which defines the collateral pool for each one of those notes in perfect detail. So what, what's, what's actually going on here? Well, we've got STB with assets and liabilities on their balance sheet. That the assets for their SPV are, of course, loans and cash. You collect the, um, the, the receipts from the, from the mortgages, 
So, but what is a mortgage? Well, it's a loan which is secured by some property, bricks and mortar, whatever. Um, and then we have the liabilities of the SPV, which are uh, notes like A, B, C, uh, notes, equity tranche, etc. So if you, want, if you want to own a, a Nassi note and you want to figure out what's actually in it, well, you can look at the token type and see, well, it's composed of, I don't know, uh, 50 mortgages. Here we've only got two. Uh, and then you can look at each one of those mortgages to see what the details of it are. Then you can even look at the collateral as well. Um, so I, I think that's pretty cool. And uh, that, that um, representing mortgage-backed uh, notes is just one application of this. I think you could um, probably the sky's the limit for what you could do with this approach for modeling tokens. Um, and then Michael Michael Barry in wouldn't have to do this because he, he would just he would just know what's in the um, in the in, in the bond straight away. And there will be no mortgage meltdown. So uh, I think this is quite cool. Um, that's actually the, the final slide of the presentation. Um, I hope it gave you a good overview of what we're looking to do. Just to summarise very quickly, um, we're we're looking to uh, create some new interfaces and types that exist within the core platform. Um, we are looking to separate the lifecycle of the token from the question of who owns it. And we're looking to consider interfaces for uh, token types themselves. And then we're, we're looking to make sure that this model is flexible enough such that you can compose these token types to, together. Um, and I, I spent a fair bit of time thinking about this. Although I could have got so, some of it wrong, and I mean, probably some of it, some of it isn't, isn't spot on yet, I, I think it's uh, certainly going in the right direction. And if you guys have any questions or thoughts uh, on what I presented, then uh, I'd, I'd love to know. So uh, over to the floor for any questions. Uh, Roger, uh, can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Uh, this is Muchitaba from EY. Um, uh, 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 I think uh, I'm trying to just grapple with the concept, but uh, keeping an insurance hat and where we are designing InsureWave, right? Uh, this is far away uh, from us, um, where we would like to see how we could support our clients, utilize a, a tokenized payment solution, okay, which is one of the modules that we will look into next year. Uh, looking into that, right, there are three key building blocks that you spoke about. One uh, was uh, around the concept of fungible states, tokens, and token definitions. Second was reference states. And the third one was data distribution groups. Yeah. So yeah. from an outside in view, for me, for this functionality to be available, these three things will need to be available in the platform or the product, right? Um, so uh, my simple question is, uh, uh, what are the timelines we are looking out for these capabilities to be available so that we can leverage in some of the use cases that we think is useful for us? Uh, okay, that, uh, thanks, good question. So um, reference states are available uh, now on master and they'll be, re be released in quarter version four. The fungible uh, state and the uh, and the pointer types should also be uh, like 99% sure that they will be available in quarter version four as well. The only thing that won't be available in quarter version four will be the um, uh, the data distribution groups feature. Um, the the actual uh, SDK for tokens itself uh, will uh, be released uh, on a different cadence uh, to the the core platform itself. So there will actually be more frequent releases. Uh, so you, you can think of uh, the, 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 the tokens SDK as a library that sits on top of Corda. It, it doesn't necessarily have to be released uh, at the same schedule of Corda itself. Um, so, th so the only thing that's really missing is the data distribution groups. Though, though there are ways to, uh, uh, to, to handle uh, syndication of token types uh, without data distribution groups. Uh, and perhaps we can talk about that offline. Maybe we should include an example or something. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And, uh, and quarter four, um, we're targeting this year. There are a few, um, there's a few um, you know, stock ship items that we have to get done. And if they take longer, then we'll have to postpone the ship. But um, you know, the, the ambition is to get that out this side of the new year, January the latest. Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, this is really interesting, uh, interesting to us as well. Thanks. Cool, thanks. Uh, any other questions? No? 
Um, okay, well, thank you very much for listening, everybody. I hope uh, you found it useful and informative. If you do um, have any questions or would like to speak to me about any of this or anyone else, then please just drop, either drop us an email or a message on Slack. I guess you, you know where we are, and we'd be happy to um, uh, happy to discuss, happy to uh, take any of your requirements. And uh, yeah, I guess I'll. It was that. A, uh, that was a great job, Roger. In a totally unbiased viewpoint, I thought that this was the best DRB I've ever been to. So thank you very much. <laughs> I have one question. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Tom. Uh, cheers, cheers. Well, just to to denigrate my contribution to the meeting further, when is quarter coin? When is quarter coin? <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> That was a joke. I think no. I think James has been serious. He really wants to see quarter coin. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, everybody. Yeah, thanks. Okay, everybody. Thank, Thank you. Thanks, guys. Good job.